this room. So, uh, my name is Marla Jean Edmonds, and I'm the Vice Provost for Global Affairs and International Studies at Ohio University. And um, I'm delighted to be here because um, historically, no, actually, I am still. I'm a Canadian. I was going to say historically, I'm a Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm going to be So I was asked to give a, a bit of a quick um, overview of the state of innovation and a few of the key um, motivators behind my tax, I guess, and, and where we're coming from and why we're doing what we're doing. So that's what I'll, I'll cover a little bit at the beginning uh, and then kind of segue into um, exactly what we're doing in our model within the different models of innovation out there and why these sort of partnerships. And then I'll mention quite briefly, just so I can keep my job, the my taxes in our program to give an idea of what we're doing. Um, so, so here we go. And we're a pretty small group, so I'm perfectly happy to, 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 to bounce ideas back and forth and let the chat um, as I'm talking. So here's a little bit of the, the very high level background or context. So for quite some time now, Canada has been working to um, supplement our primary reliance on commodity-based resources <coughs> with a more knowledge-based economy. Um, there's nothing wrong with the primary uh, 
resource-based economy, but to get higher multiples on it is interesting and something we've been working towards for quite some time. To have a knowledge-based economy, we need knowledge workers who are plugged into the external society, so that goes without saying. So we've been doing for a long time this, you know, cutting down trees and selling the lumber uh, pretty much as is. And there's, again, nothing wrong with that. It's a perfectly viable, viably and good business model. But if you add a little bit of this and turn your scrap into this and sell it for ridiculous amounts of money and make it build it themselves, you can actually have a pretty strong economy. So that's what we're trying to figure out a little bit more. Um, so innovation, the big picture, and I again, this is a pretty brief presentation, so I apologize for being very superficial here, but there's a couple of key metrics when you talk about innovation. So a few of those are herd, so government expenditure on R&D, how much your government's spending on R&D, herd, how much your higher ed is spending on R&D, bird, how much your business expenditure on R&D. Um, so those are three pretty key ones. Your productivity rate, so as Krugman said, productivity isn't everything, but when you boil it all down, or in the long run, it's pretty much everything. You heard echoes of that earlier today. And then there's direct versus indirect support of research. So are you going to directly share the cost of a project, that project coming up, direct? Or are you indirectly paying back if something fits the criteria one year down the So these are some of the key metrics that are quite relevant when you're talking about innovation and knowledge-based economy. So let's look at Canada. And I'm going to be a little bit tough on Canada because well, it turns out we're a lot of Canadians here, but I thought we'd be amongst uh, my American uh, friends. So, what's very good in Canada is we have a high GER, high government expenditure on research. We have a high HER, high higher ed expenditure on research. So that's that's really good. Um, the business expenditure on research right now is, is low. It needs to get higher, and that's something we're actively working on. That's not so good. Our productivity is, is quite low. It's too low, lower than where we want it. So we need to work on that, and we've really relied a lot on indirect measures of supporting research, uh, like tax back on, on R&D, for example. And we're really trying to pivot towards more direct focus and direct support of research. So that's an overly simplified, very high level overview of uh, you know, some of the Canadian metrics and innovation. If you look at the US, um, your GERD is actually very high, um, HERD and GERD as well, and the trend is climbing. Um, and you have many direct uh, measures of supporting R&D. So that's actually very positive and quite good. The productivity rate is, is actually quite high. And I'm not really talking relative to, to all the countries, but overall, generally speaking, it's fairly, fairly well off. Some people have even argued that the US is the most innovative country in the world. I won't go into politics here, but it's been thrown around recently that, that that's the case. Well, is it really? Um, it depends what metrics you use to qualify that. If you're looking at most patents in the world right now, South Korea takes that spot. If you're looking at the top position uh, in the World Intellectual Property Organization's uh, Innovation Index, um, right now Switzerland takes that spot. A number of um, uh, people have argued and made the case that the US is probably more like four or fifth most innovative in the world. Again, my point here isn't absolute numbers. It really depends what, you're using, what criteria you're using to define it. My point is, it isn't a slam dunk. For Canada or the US, there is a pretty strong competition out there in an environment that's changing very rapidly. And just like in the music industry, popular band can't sit back and assume that their records will get sold and they'll live off of that the rest of their life. You need to keep innovating and you need to stay on the ball. That's really my take home at this level. So my argument is, you know, the solution to that is more partnerships with academia. But what about what's gotten trendy about talking about the disposable academic and, and you know, universities are just Ponzi schemes? Um, and you know, there's this bubble out there, and really there's too many PhDs anyways, and, and really you know, there's no STEM crisis at all. Um, this has gotten kind of trendy in the media. I'm not even going to put any weight to this. We heard some good stats this morning from Lauren. Uh, we heard some again from Eric uh, during his presentation at lunch. Um, there is no question that we need more PhDs. In fact, if you look at the PhD rate, um, both Canada and the US, it has been slipping if you look at other OECD countries. So I'm not even going to go into that conversation, uh, but I will assert very strongly. Uh, actually, here's a, a nice quote that, that, that sums it up kind of nicely for me. Um, again, at a fairly high level. So Norman Augustine was a Lockheed Martin, uh, published an op-ed in that five years ago. And he said, in my position as CEO of a firm employing over 80,000 engineers, I can testify that most were excellent engineers. But the factor that most distinguished those who advanced in the organization was the ability to think broadly, read and write clearly. My point here is 
the, the, the name of the game right now is to be as multi-skilled as possible. And we heard talking about having, I argue, people in liberal arts who understand programming and IT, having people in IT and programming who understand liberal arts as well. Why? Because when you're in this environment that's changing incredibly fast, the name of the game is how fast you're able to adjust to that reality. So you're not training for a job because the top five jobs right now didn't exist 15 years ago or so exactly if that's that and something like that. And it's getting even worse as Eric mentioned during his presentation. So it's all about being multifaceted and multi-skilled to be able to adapt depending on what reality is in the present moment. So the big question to me, the more interesting question, um, are we producing too many PhDs? No, there's no question about it. In fact, we're probably not producing enough. Um, the real question is, why aren't in some of the cases our PhDs not better plugged into society and what can we do about it? And I'm talking about PhDs, you can apply this to graduate level as well, to masters, and arguably also undergraduate and co-op as we talked about a lot today. We heard the need for technicians, skilled technicians, and skilled um, people at the college level is just as important as these higher degrees. So here's a couple of stats that are interesting, kind of scary. In 86, 34% of PhD hold, uh, holders obtained a faculty Position. 2001, that was down to 24. Uh, this is going to depend on the faculty and the discipline, but, but generally speaking. And right now, it's pretty agreed on that it's under 20%, 18, 19, 20, depending on the number. Yet business leaders are expressing, and you heard it again today, that there is a shortage in highly skilled personnel. So what's going on here? Well, one thing is, for sure, we're no longer educating for purely academic positions. That's no longer the case. I argue that the two communities need each other. So if we look on both sides, on the university side, there's a need for more funding, more sustained funding. If you look at the average ramp-up time of the average university project, it's generally a fairly slow ramp-up, and then a fairly long period within the project, and then you tear it apart afterwards and dig into the, the, the data. Again, a slow ramp-down afterwards. But fairly deep dive once the project is full. Um, again, on the university side, there's a need to build better and wider networks for our graduates, and there's a need to access real data, real world problems. To speak to most researchers, this is what's making them tick. That's what they want to, to work on real relevant problems and have their graduates working on that as well. So this, again, is an oversimplification, but a few of the, the, the important factors in our university realities. And on the industry side, there's a need to increase productivity. There's a, if you look at the average projects, there's an incredibly fast ramp up. Um, often a decision will be taken, a board meeting or wherever, weekly meetings, they'll decide to tackle something. By the next month, that project is rolling. Three, four months later, it's ramping down, and then it's uh, very, very fast, very aggressive. That sense of urgency is very powerful. It's built a lot of things, but it can sometimes be fairly nearsighted and it leaves you at the mercy of being blindsided. Um, there's a need to access highly skilled individuals. Again, we've heard that from the industry leaders today loud and clear. And finally, there's a need to mechanize, to institutionalize innovation without eating up all of your internal resources. How do you flesh out? How do you explore things until it reaches a certain threshold that it is worth pulling into your internal program? So these are two realities that I would argue to you are almost mirror, are almost <coughs> symmetrical to each other. And each other's strengths and weaknesses complement the two communities incredibly well. So I'd say, I'd argue, and my tax position is that what we really need are better bridges between the two communities in order to help them both tackle their own weaknesses and strengths, or <coughs> the other ones with their mutual strengths. When you look at university research, um, I think there's a false uh, binary reality that's been created about is it fundamental or is there applied research. Um, I, I don't see it as one or the other. It's really a continuum. And yes, when you're at the two opposing ends of the continuum, that looks quite different, and that could almost a binary. But really, it's a continuum, and it's a, a wide array of gray in between. So if you look at collaborating uh, models of innovation with universities, there's a few different models that go with this continuum from you know, fundamental to, to pure research. There's the poll model, where, oh, this isn't the most, uh, sorry, there's a mistake here. Uh, so that should be push on the fundamental side, so it's where you're pushing a university technology onto the external community, versus a poll model where the industry says, here's what I need, and pull that from the university side. So that's the push-pull model of innovation. 
um, which, and on, again, on each extreme end, it's pretty obvious. There's a pretty clear difference. So things like spin-outs out of a university or um, licensing out, that's pretty clearly you know, from the university up into the community. And on the other end, when a, a company gives a contract to a university researcher, that's pretty clearly pulled from the industrial side. Um, but again, the reality is there's a zone in the middle of mutual interest, which is my tax sweet spot. This is where we play. We don't fund any fundamental research. We don't fund any pure D. We're always looking for projects in that area in the middle of mutual benefit to the two partners. That is incredibly difficult to do. This is not the easy way to do it. Much easier to just buy a piece of IP and now you own it. But more simplistic. So I'll, put, I'll, I'll change a little bit into to my tax and our mandate. So our mandate at the highest level is to drive innovation by helping you know, university, governments, and industry uh, work together more. And actually, I'm happy to say we've convinced the government after years of lobbying that we can actually now even work with not-for-profit groups as long as there's a case for economic impact that's been made. So I use the term industry at large, external community and university. How do we do this? Uh, we have a model to, we have a number of programs where we're looking to attract the very best, either from within the country or other countries, to train them as well as possible, to tool them, to retain them, getting them into job, allowing them to have networks, contacts, and then deploy them into society. That could mean one of the lucky 18, 20% getting a faculty position, but better connected to the external community, or going to work for an organization, applying the skills that you've learned in university. Our model of collaborative innovation um, is founded on this pretty old principle of having people on the ground who are honest brokers, who care about the two communities, Almost everyone at MyTax has a research background and has worked in the private sector um, who understand the realities and go around looking for opportunities, looking to convince, to show, to pitch the university's benefits in industry and vice versa, and looking for champions in the two communities, and then bringing them together. And once they're together, you're not done. Now you're going to talk about needs. You're going to look for that area of mutual interest and carve out a project that should be win-win. Again, this is not the easy way to do it, but we felt like it was where there was the biggest gap in the market and the biggest need, so we took it on. Um, you need a lot of people to do that. You need people who are given resources and time to invest in these relationships to become the trusted advisors in the two communities. So again, we're finding areas of mutual benefit regardless of where the need came from. It's always going to emerge, usually going to emerge from one side or the other. Either you have a really cool technology that a researcher says, well, I think this could be useful in, you know, wherever, in, in small molecule pharma, or you have a director of research in, in pharma who says, I, I can't deal with this problem, I don't know how to, uh, how to get it fixed, can you help me with it? So we'll start with, we'll take either of those presenting you know, problems, but then we'll look for the area of mutual interest. So we'll say, these components, this is pure development, you can hire someone, have someone on your team do it. Private sector is much better at doing that, you can develop, it's off the shelf. But this part is very interesting for a, a research project, an applied research project. Finally, our programs are always about creating a platform that is as unrestricted as possible. So we try not to police. At every step, we try to leave the onus of the decision to be in the power of the person who, has, um, who could make that call the most logical. So we're not going to question the company's business case. They're always putting real money, real cash, not in kind cash into the project. They're doing that, it's probably that there is a business case, but that's for them to make, not for us a challenge. We're not going to question the researcher or the industrial partner on the intern who was selected. Why was this master with this PhD? Maybe another one has a higher GPA. That's not the point. This one was a fit. This one they met, they liked them, they felt like they could do the project. We're not going to vet that. What we do vet is the integrity of the project. So we do an external peer review, uh, 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 external review on all the projects. We make sure that the, the science is valid that the methodology should be able to produce the result that they want. If not, there's a flag raise, and we'll say, well, I'm not sure about that, or why did you use this, or why don't you plug this in? Um, but that's what we're looking at. Our programs are always scalable. So whenever we're, fun, we're putting together a new pilot program, we're wondering, could this scale? And using the same formula, could you do a small project that a, a small startup would be interested in doing, but then could you scale that up to a multi-million dollar, multi-year project? All of our programs are built around these concepts. And finally, high success rate because we're so involved. So this is not a funding agency scenario where you send in an application and it goes behind kind of a, a 
black wall with a Ouija board and you get an answer and hopefully you got it or you didn't. Um, this is very different. We're looking at 98, 99% success rates on uh, requests for, for funding from us. Now we're cheating a bit because we've been involved, we've been together in a partnership, we've already removed aspects that didn't make sense, we've helped with the application, we've made sure that, 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 that it's pretty sound. Um, but that's not really cheating, that's called saving people's time and not wasting time. So but that's really a, a key part of our program. So what is my tax? Very quickly, we're an independent, uh, not-for-profit, national not-for-profit. We're actually governed by Canadian universities. Every Canadian research university is a member of my tax, 60 plus universities. But if you look at our board, it's 50% industry, uh, C-level industry, and 50% academics. Um, so we really serve the communities who uh, we report to rather than the communities who we serve. Um, I'll add to what, what, um, what was said, not only do we have funding from the federal governments and the provinces, the states, and industry, but we also have university dollars. The universities also fund our programs that are not government funded, that allows us to keep creating new programs. This is unheard of, that you are accountable to all four stakeholder groups who you are there to serve. So if you stop being relevant, the day we're not relevant, we don't have an operating budget anymore. It's all tied to our programs. Um, we're now reaching a cruising speed of almost 4,000 projects per year. These are applied research graduate, postgraduate projects. That rivals how many undergraduate co-op projects are happening in Canada. This is enormous. And coming from a place where people argue that businesses don't invest enough in research, these are all projects where businesses put their real money in. So it's not necessarily a matter of not wanting to fund it, maybe a matter of lowering the risk and making it more user friendly. We have 130, we're almost at 140 people right now with 30 offices across the country. Um, we have three major offices in three major cities, three of the major cities in Canada. What that means is there's people in every university, multiple people are stationed in the big universities who know the research champions, who know the Office of Research Services, the tech transfer people, and the researchers who are in most relevant. I also have a team who's working with industry, a major accounts team, who's investing time on their research pipeline and helping them to creating partnerships with universities. So on both ends, we're investing a lot of time to know the communities well and give them our expertise. I just want to highlight what you just said, just to make sure that people realize that many of their employees are actually based inside the university. I, I, I really think that's an important piece of your story, is how you create such a close connection to the, really to the students and to the researchers matching the industry opportunities. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And literally in some of the large universities, we have two to three people who are stationed there, their offices is there. Um, and the same thing on the industrial side. So we have, um, so we have a few key programs, I, I realize I'm, I'm getting against the wall on time, we have a few key programs, I don't too much detail, like that's Accelerate, this is uh, leveraging industrial dollars towards applied research around their problems um, for graduates, postgraduates. Elevate is specifically for postdocs, it's up to people who have a little bit more experience get them a little bit more money, and they're usually being groomed to take on a position as a director of our group, for example. Um, and we give them professional development skills tied in and put together a training program around that individual. Um, STEP, these are professional development skills but for graduates at large, so entrepreneurialism, intellectual property, business etiquette, project management, real project management. Um, Global Link, so this is what uh, LG was talking about. This is where it's about plug, making sure that Canada stays relevant on the international stage. And this is not a simple proposition. We're going to governments and saying, we want your money, our government, to send our grads abroad. We're gonna send Canadians work in, in, in Brazilian companies. We're gonna send them to work in Indian companies. Like, how does that, we're trying to bring them in. But we're also gonna bring the best of the Indian students into Canada. And why do we do that? Because we believe in our country, we think it's a great country. We think once they're here, they're gonna like it, they're gonna have a great experience. And you know what, that's what happens. And the ones who, most of them will go back to their countries, that's fine, they now have ties with Canadian researchers. And now, guess what, they're working with Canadian companies too, so the companies have a landing pad with an international market. Um, and finally, Converge is our most recent program. This is about plugging in uh, small, medium companies into multinational procurement chains and working with universities to drive the technology up to a level that it could be pre commercial or, or approved on uh, the vendors list. Um, and this is a little bit different, it's a, it's a different position that we've taken. Um, it's a little bit different from applied research. 
um, but huge impact to obviously the economy and society. So our Canadian uh, governmental funders, in every province in Canada is funded. I'm missing one there in terms of the logo as well as the Canadian federal government. Uh, this is just a couple of our partners, private partners, but there's hundreds of them on our website. through all three of them and then we'll chat, okay? All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna to try to find a spot where I can make a better, I don't make a door and block everything due to my size. Um, Jesse has a really nice introduction and there's gonna be some things where um, I add on to what Jesse said and, and in fact, actually, I will say that um, you fail to realize that you do actually fund basic research you just don't know. Um, I realized that. Um, and I'll talk about that in the creative, which is grants. Um, but I come from uh, across the river from Detroit. Um, and uh, this so happens to be the Ambassador Bridge. This is the bridge that the uh, Council uh, George was speaking about today. The, um, and I, I come from you from Windsor. I'm an associate professor from the Department of Kinesiology, and I'm also appointed to mechanical automotive materials engineering. And, I, and I'll give you a brief kind of overline of my research and how it ties into all of this, just to kind of give you an understanding of who I am and what I do. But, but really, this bridge is a metaphor. Um, and I, I did this slide years ago when I started doing my research, kind of think about how I was going to do research. But it really has a a number of metaphors. Well, first of all, over here is Windsor, and over here is Detroit. Um, and in fact, the University of Windsor is right here at the base of the bridge, and I see those 10,000 trucks a day go across the border. Um, so, so kind of to point out the globalization, yeah, we're, we're right next door to you, but still global. Right? So the metaphor is kind of linking um, the United States with Canada. And how do I do that? Well. I work in an area in automotive. Well, right over here is what we used to call the big three. Unfortunately, we don't call them that anymore. Um, however, the Detroit three. Um, but also kind of bridging the gap between academics over here and um, just in Canada. Uh, stay with me with this metaphor. <laughs> the academics over here and industry over here. So it's really this bridging between the two a number of different things in this world to come together, and that's why I'm so glad that you're here. I think this is a great initiative, and I truly believe in it. And it was quite interesting to listen to um, uh, Eric uh, from Siemens today, and I'll show you some of the linkage even between that and what I do in my lab. Um, I was quite excited to come in and say. But in terms of my research area, I come from the area of kinesiology, so studying human movement, but I apply that to understand injury reduction. In injury reduction, specifically in the automotive industry, or I should say the manufacturing industry, because we have operators that put our vehicles together. Um, I know it was a little scary watching Eric's uh, presentation today with robots. Trust me, uh, I'm not saying he doesn't know what he's talking about, but I think we'll always have people put things together because you have to understand the complexity behind the human body and how we control the human body to do certain things. But really, my whole goal here is to reduce injuries to our operators. My, my PhD was looking at spine mechanics. Low back injuries is the number one uh, injured, complained about part of the body, and it costs millions and millions, actually billions of dollars across the globe. So I try to understand it from a mechanistic point of view, using engineering principles and math, and try to understand all of that. And that's what, what I'm calling my basic science, and also the meaning of that. And then if you look at my quote unquote applied research, which I'm going to challenge you to think differently about this, uh, in this, this paradox of what's basic and what's applied research. But really, my, my applied research is working in uh, the manufacturing industry, coming up with um, numbers so that industry can use to say, well, that demand on the operator is going to exceed their capacity, and that's going to cause an increased risk of injury. That's what I do as an ergonomics. Right? It's, it's, it's simple materials engineering. You take a piece of wood, you bend it to pass its yield point, you break it, and now you don't have a piece of wood. Or you just get two pieces. 
but also in virtual reality ergonomics, where kind of Eric was talking about today, where we are building the future vehicle five years in advance. And I don't mean designing the new F-150 or whatnot. I'm talking about the production plants that we are building those things in, doing that virtually. And he talked about today, put the Oculus Rift on and try to do something. I do that in my lab, right, where we can immerse people into a virtual plant to try to figure out if a person could reach that far or do this particular job that maybe some engineer sat at their desk designing but didn't have a really good understanding of how the human body would work to put that together. So that's what I'm going to be talking a little bit about today. But again, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you to think differently of research. And for those who are academics here or who are maybe in charge of research at their own institute, to kind of challenge the way us researchers think and how we interact with, with the world. So really, higher level of education we think of and especially those who may not have gone to uh, college or university, think of this kind of back in the medieval days when we wear our gowns. I guess I have a gown that I wear to graduation, and um, yes, it's a big gown. But that, that was used to keep warm in the medieval days when someone would pontificate their philosophies onto society. And unfortunately, some people still think that, that we sit in this ivory tower and just pontificate down amongst the people. But really, that's kind of the traditional thought. And sure, there's still some of that out there, and you may have had bad experiences when you were at school and had felt that about some professor or not. But really, what we're here for is to help uh, educate and improve society for community, for for, for a better community or for global as we're talking about here. And we're trying to advance knowledge in all areas from our research, right? We do our research, we then disseminate that down to the public and hopefully things get better. In science and technology and art and sociology, I forgot to put health here, sorry. Um, but really, if we think about what today's reality as my role in society, um, if I want to do something, <coughs> it requires money. I, yes, have my own little sandbox that I'd like to play in, which is my spine research, because I was really interested in it, but at the end of the day, what do I apply to that, right? And it's my philosophy that anytime I do something that's in research, it better be applicable. It just better not be something that I can publish in something that gets put in, bound into a journal, or thing in the old days, bound into a journal, put into a library just to stack it on a shelf. We require that money to educate further graduate students, make new scientists, so that, again, if we have the shortage of PhD, that's one of my jobs, is to help educate more. Facilities and equipment, I can't do my research without having that stuff. So we need money to do these things. And in fact, unlike Canada, because in Canada, I have a 12-month contract, it's not a contract, it's a job, I don't sign a contract. But in the United States, I know that in some institutions, you have a nine-month contract, go away for the summer or supplementary income through your research to get this point. So there's, there's a lot of stress that comes on to us to, uh, to be able to get the money so that we can perform. I think that we need to realize as academics, well, here I'm pretty much preaching to the choir here, but we as academics need to, to change our reality, change our, our focus. In, in reality, in 2016, I'm under the understanding that 14% of all applicants to the National Institute of Health applications are actually funded. 14%. In Canada, it's approximately one quarter of all um, NSERC. So NSERC is uh, the Natural Science Engineering Research Council. It's one of our pinnacles, our, our funding. So how do we do our research? You have to be creative. I think really a big shift has to occur in my view. And that field is, well, if I go for an NHI funding or I go to NSER in Canada, that's the pinnacle. That's what goes on my CV and that gets me promotion and it gets me recognition in my field and I feel all great and whatever. In NSER, there is NSER discovery, which is again a lot of funds where you, you propose, hopefully you get that money, and then you go do whatever you want with it, which is really hard for me to really grasp as a person that works in the industry. It's prestigious to our universities. 
it helps us through our promotion through the ranks, going from you know, a lecturer, let's say, to assistant professor to associate professor to professor to professor of merits. For the university, it's used in marketing and additional lot of funding. So in Canada, we have these research chairs that are basically get uh, an exempt of your teaching, and all you do is research. But every institution gets so many of them based on how much of this NSERT funding you have. And it's a recruitment tool. But frankly, from my perspective, how many undergrads that we're trying to attract understand what an NSERT research chair or whatever is? Right? It's great on the website, but really what is that? Because an undergrad wants to get there, learn knowledge, and really doesn't know anything about research at that point. So, so in, in my area, Discovery Grant, you can capture, in the kind of mechanical engineering area, about $150,000 over five years. So that's 30 grand uh, Canadian a year. Well, a PhD costs us $22,500 a year. So your budget's blown, pretty much. And then you need equipment and facilities and you know disposable costs and, and conferences and all that. Where is that money? Okay. Well, this is where the, the, the fundamental shift of thought has to go, at least in my own opinion. It's company partnership. Now the problem with company partnership for most academics is the thought between basic and applied research. If we kind of remember back up here in this prestige, okay? So most scientists that you talk to say, well, I want to be a basic researcher. I want to sit in my lab and I want to come up with something. I want to be published in science or nature or something like that. Whereas I believe in applied research. And we'll talk about kind of that in a second. But what I want to talk to you about, if anyone's ever heard of Louis Pasteur, does anyone know of Louis Pasteur? Okay. So, back many years ago in France, he was a researcher. In fact, he was a chemist and a microbiologist. You might know him from some of the works that he did in vaccinations, to deal with rabies or anthrax, but really we know him from pasteurization, right? What he said which was fundamental is, there's not pure science, basic science, and applied science, but only science uh, and the application of science. So with that perspective, my PhD advisor, other than giving me the tools to do research and whatnot, helps me think philosophically, pointed me to this Pasteur's Quadrant. It's a, it's a book and a thought process coming from Donald Stokes. And when you look at this, and you look at this cube, and you say, OK, in terms of a researcher, I want a quest for understanding. And you're trying to fit yourself into, into one of these boxes. Do I need this being up? Yep, I'll do as quick as possible. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I had this down with 50 years ago. But if I get something across to you, this is one of the things that I really want to get across to you. If you think about Pastor's Quadrant, there's a quest for understanding. And this is kind of what you were dealing with, you were talking about before. But if you do have a fundamental quest for understanding, that's a yes, and consideration for use of that research, well then that's basic research, like Niles Bohr or, or the person that looked at atoms. But if you have a quest for understanding and consideration for use, we're talking about use-inspired research. Louis Pasteur. Or if you are consider consideration for use, but not a fundamental understanding, we're talking about applied research here. So what I'm talking about is that as a researcher, I don't feel that I should fit in one box, that I can move throughout this, right? And that's where a company will come to me and say, hey, we don't know about this. Are you interested in researching in this? And I will say, yes. And that could be the applied portion of it, but to your point, you may fund that, but you don't realize that I know I can give them something, but I can still peel back the layers of an onion and I can get back up into here to understand the human body. So it's not that you have to stick in one zone, but you can use that money to answer the question that the company wants, but also dive down into the basic research if you so like. So what I can tell you about with our program, we have really experiential learning. And this would be the graduate program. So you think of a traditional, <coughs> pardon me, traditional graduate program being a master's thesis, being in a lab hypothesis driven. Well, we do have that, but we also have this internship uh, program as well with our master's students. We take more courses, 
sorry if I didn't learn. You take more courses, but what you are required to do is to go up to the work world and do a research project. Now it's more case by case by case case party study. And that's what Rob's going to talk about today. So we'll have his 10 minutes in just a couple of seconds. <laughs> but that's what we have. So we talk about funding and we talk about partnerships and we talk about the wonderful things that Montex has available for us. But you also have to have a shift in thought, or at least expand your thought. But you also have to go away from the norm of normal curriculum. And I mean, build something this into your program at institutions that it's not just a thesis where they're sitting in a lab, but they're going out doing the actual work. They get their courses and they get real work uh, experience. And the, the, the problem with that change is it's not just the academics as a researcher that has to change, it's our model of our thought of our promotion through the ranks or how we are judged and get tenure and all those things because we have to change that if some of this stuff can't be published. Well, I understand publishing and I understand that peer reviews have to happen, but what about the technical reports that I write for 4GM and Chrysler? They are worth something. They are used right away. Yes, they haven't been vetted by a bunch of scientists, but I can guarantee you those values are being used. So we've got to kind of think about that. So if you just give me two seconds, all right, Rob, because that'll give you the still 15 minutes, right? We want to have to decide the topic. Okay. So what I think that you have to understand, or at least push down onto the researchers that are going to be involved in this, is understanding this. You want, you understand as a researcher that I have the tools to help you understand your questions. We heard earlier today one of the things where, in, in the aerospace one, where the, I hear it all the time, researchers go in the meeting and say they think they know what you need. Well, that's not the truth. You have the tools that can help you answer the questions that that company needs. So you have equipment, expertise, time, but you have to understand the liberals. Right? You have to understand that these companies are giving you money, whether it's my tax or if it's private uh, funded. You have the liberals. Because those people that got you the money to do the research have to report to somebody. We all, we all report to somebody. So you have to understand deliverables. And this scares academics. Because they're used to saying, well, I'm just going to do things and I need my time. And yeah, we do need our time, but you have deliverables and you have to deliver. The big key is you have to listen. When you go into a room and you're with a whole bunch of people in, in, in industry, you have to listen. You can't think that you know everything. Just because you have a PhD, you have to listen and teach your people that they have to listen to where the questions may lie. Because you might have to pull out where that question is from what these people are talking about. You're the subject matter expert, but they are also as well. So intellectual property and patents are problems as well. But really, if I can finish off with this, and then we get to show off our research, that's okay. Um, Rob will be able to show some more. Industry, you have to be realistic. So those who are in the industry here, trying to meet up with people, you have to be realistic. The science is imperfect, as is medicine. And you may want something, but you might not get exactly what you want. Because it's not built yet, it's not designed yet, it's not even thought about yet. So you have to be realistic um, on your side. Because science is imperfect. And you've got to be dynamic. There are things where I, said I was going to do this, I come back to the company and I can't do this because the technology isn't there yet, but I can give you that, which is not exactly what you wanted, but you're dynamic enough to get something out of this. And you have to have an understanding that you're willing to accept the results. If I'm going to give you results and give you my professional <coughs> you might not like it, but you actually know the results now. You've got to be able to accept that. And publishing too. We have to publish because it's important for us not just through getting our progression through the ranks and our CVs, but we also believe in getting this out to the public as well, this information. So anyways, I'll leave it at that um, uh, so that we can get through and uh, have Rob tell his story. Today about uh, the MyTax program, and from 
from the, uh, the big picture and also from the uh, university perspective uh, with Dr. Ford's lab and his relationship that he's had with the MITAC Accelerator Program. And I'm, I'm just kind of more of a case study or an example of one of the students who benefited from it. And I, I was uh, fortunate enough to be a, a, an MHK student at the University of Windsor. And uh, Dr. Ford had a research project that he, he wanted to uh, complete with a corporate partner that also had a problem that they need, needed research. So I was a graduate student in the, uh, the uh, University of Windsor uh, Human Kinetics Department. And uh, I, I uh, was taken on as an intern with my tax funding to complete that project. So just uh, really briefly, it's funny because his opening slide there with the bridge, I'm now uh, driving across that bridge every day to get to work, where I work at Ford Motor Company um, as an ergonomist for the uh, the, the video final uh, assembly ergonomics. So it's kind of kind of neat how that ties in. Um, so uh, yeah, I, uh, through my internship process, though, uh, the important thing is that uh, I did an internship for the Ford Motor Company through the University of Windsor in a in a Canadian Ford plant. So in Oakville Assembly, and I did an eight month internship there. And uh, as a result, I was hired on by by the Ford Motor Company. I completed my, my, uh, my internship. And uh, I'm still kind of just finishing up my master's degree right now, but I'm, I've been working at Ford for almost a year and a half. Uh, and just as a kind of a backstory to the backstory, um, before that, I worked at the Ford Motor Company in Windsor for 10 years on the assembly line. And uh, with uh, around 2008, there was some downsizing. They closed some plants. And one of the plants that I worked at, one of them was, was closed. And so I was kind of had a, a, to choose a new career path, and it was I just had to decide what if, you know I have an opportunity to decide which way I'm going to go and uh, what are my interests. So I was always interested in fitness, how the human body works, and uh, I ended up going back to uh, to school, to university, and taking human kinetics. And it, it made a lot of sense to uh, to end up going into the graduate program at University of Windsor because they had an internship program. So I knew that. You know, not only just learning about human kinetics and physiology, but also I could get that valuable internship experience out of it, where just the amount that I learned in the internship is very comparable to, you know, I, I learned a ton in the academic setting, but you learn a lot of valuable lessons that complement that in throughout doing the inter internship. So just how to use uh, technology, how to, um, the importance of networking, getting things done uh, when you're, when you're working in that, in that environment. So I'll just briefly go over the research project that, uh, that I worked on when I was there. So it was at the Ford Motor Company Oakville Assembly Complex. And really, the, the main thing is, in the automotive industry, no matter how great the ergonomics are, and Ford does pursue ergonomics probably more than any, any automotive company or any comparable to the best in, in manufacturing in the world. But injuries still do occur. So when a, when a worker is injured in an assembly plant, at some point, they you want to get them back to work. So uh, and you want to take advantage of, there's a lot of technology and science that is being used in ergonomics to prevent injuries. So how can we leverage some of that expertise and, and put it into the return to work uh, process? So the key thing is Dr. Court was talking about uh, demands and capacity, and it's the same thing with return to work. So, you have a rehabilitated worker, and you want to try and get them back to their job. So the two key parts of the equation are, what is the physical capacity of the rehabilitated worker? So a medical professional can assess that adequately. But also, what are the demands of the job that we're returning them to? So the, the, the issue was uh, that they were finding at Ford was, it was kind of an a antiquated process to, to do that, the capacity analysis side. So they're looking at, it's something called uh, a physical demands analysis. So it's an analysis of a particular job, usually conducted by a kinesiologist or someone with an ergonomic background, but it was essentially a pen and paper form that was filled out, and it was a valuable tool, but it, in some ways it could gather a lot of information that might not be uh, the most meaningful to the end user. So it, it's, uh, they would go out, assess the job, uh, how much force is required to, to complete the job, what kind of postures are required in order to complete the job? Are these high-risk postures? And kind of analyze that, record everything in a 
in a chart, and then that would be something that you would provide to the medical professional who's making that judgment on returning the, the work into work and, and uh, what, are, what are the demands of the job. So uh, Dr. Court, we use a lot in his lab um, Jack ergonomic software, which interesting enough is a Siemens product and it's a state-of-the-art ergonomics uh, software that uses uh, digital human modeling in order to, to analyze the physical demands of a job. So it's, it's, it's typically used on the ergonomic side where we want to do it as upstream as possible, which is by my current position at board, where we want to prevent the injuries in the first place. So how can we make jobs better using the software, analyzing it, and taking some of the risk out of the job in the, kind of from the upfront perspective? So the idea of this research project is, why not leverage some of that expertise and, and also use it in the return to work process? So the issue was, when you have a doctor who's looking at you know, all the medical stuff that, that he's looking at to, to assess the person's capacity, but also he's, not many medical professionals have ever been out on the plant floor. So it might not be the most meaningful document to have a list of postures that a worker has to do to be in how much forces that they have to uh, they have to use to do the job to really have that medical professional have a real idea of what am I sending this rehabilitated worker back to. So the idea was, especially at Oakville, where they're not allowed to take videos and use them to send to the medical professionals, they really all they had was this chart to go by to, to uh, assess the capacity. So I'll just what we the idea was to use the simulation created in this uh, Jack software using Task Simulation Builder, which is a powerful uh, powerful tool for, for creating simulations. And I'll just kind of get to one here. So this is a simulation of a job that that was uh, in Oakville Assembly. So one of 20 that, that we created. And uh, so what we did is it was kind of an exhaustive process of going down to a job, recording all the data we can about that job. So measuring everything from uh, all the dunnage, where is a person picking a box from, uh, what, how, how high is it off the ground, how, how far of a walk did it have to get to the vehicle. Taking the vehicle from the CAD that, they, that we have from Ford, putting that in a simulation. What height is that vehicle at on the assembly line at that particular workstation? Uh, where, where is the, the gun position that he uses for that, that task? And combining all this into creating a simulation of that job, so now we can take that, show that to the doctor, and they're going to have a much better idea of what the actual demands of that job is that this worker is being returned to, so they can they can make a better judgment in terms in terms of a return to work uh, assessment. So just really briefly, an important part of the project was we went through all the work to create a simulation. So well, we've got all this data in this software. What else can we do with it? And at the time, uh, there wasn't really a tool to kind of put it into a nice format that you might present to someone who's not an ergonomic professional. So working with Siemens, we worked together to develop outputs that you could, once you create a simulation, now you had, we call it an advanced PDA assessment. So you, we could take all that data and put it out in a format that is easily readable and understandable to a non-ergonomist who can then use that in making their judgment of returning to work. So every joint angle that that operator used when they're conducting that job, it's all recorded over time, and we can put it into a nice, quick format. So if the, the doctor was looking at shoulder injury, he could look at, oh, looking at the shoulder, he really only has to raise it over his head for, you know, 10 seconds a cycle, maybe it's an okay job to return this person to, or, or the opposite, it might not be. So we've got all this data, we can now put it out to how many reaches are close far, from, uh, from the operator to make and just into a format that's meaningful. Also, uh, things like that's calculated in the ergonomic software, how much back compression, uh, time history of that, and just other meaningful variables, um, back uh, compression over time, also uh, the, the moment of, uh, the moment of, um, sorry, uh, yeah, so the cumulative moment, which is important, so how much, what's, What's the, uh, the moment at the back? So how much force is acting on the back? Rotational force, but over time, and add up the entire, over the entire cycle, what's the accumulated moment or force that's occurring at the lower back for that job? And so they quickly, the total's not in here, but it would uh, tell you over the day, how's that compared to the threshold? Do they, do they exceed the threshold that's recommended, or how much 
how much force is being exerted on a person's lower back for an entire working day. So this, all the data is in the simulation, once we've created it, and, and now the idea of an advanced uh, PDA analysis is we could get this to a medical professional who could then make a more, a more educated, meaningful decision in terms of a return to work process. So that was pretty much the, the research that we were, that my internship was all about, and uh, it, was a, it was an amazing experience, and I learned an amazing amount in the process, and the end result was just, you know, getting hired on before I had a chance to even totally complete it was pretty much the best case scenario. So, <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, and also it did feed into future research for, for Dr. Ford's lab that uh, they're going to explore this uh, further, they're, they're going to use um, they're going to use uh, new technology in terms of gathering data using uh, gyro suits to to get bring them onto the plant floor, floor and using kind of state of the art technology in order to get that input to make the simulation in the first place. So that is, that's pretty much you know the the, uh, the the quick summarized version of uh, the research uh, project and uh, it, it was uh, an amazing experience for me and uh, it really was. Uh, Thanks to the University of Windsor and to the My Tax program that, that kind of made it all happen. So, yes. Thank you. So I, I hope you can see the link between My Tax as the foundation, how it's made the university industry really link to the, yeah, the job, and it's a global job, and the wonderful tension between research and industry in terms of bridging the gap. I think that was eloquently presented. That that's very real. So, questions? You know, a little bit of time. How does MITAC relate to CREA? Uh, what's is their relationship? Yeah, good question. Um, we work closely together. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, CREAC uh, was the question. How does MITAC relate to CREA? Who Denis Faubert was is the uh, executive director of CREAC on the on the panel this morning. CREAC is an aerospace consortium. Um, research consortium uh, who sets up and, and, and projects and has membership based, industry membership based, and they're actually quite a nice model where they have a symposium, all the different companies will come together and say, here's what's keeping me up at night, here's what's keeping me up at night, oh, let's work on that one together, and they go off and, and form a project. So CREAC is an industry membership based aerospace consortium. We are a um, university based but governed by industry and universities. We fund the highly qualified personnel, HQP, which is it's a political acronym which allows certain ministries to fund projects without stepping on education ministries, toes to be quite honest. So how do we work together? That's just the background. We will get together and co-fund projects. So often I may bring something to the table or I may be working with partners that make sense as a CREAC project, um, or I'll be brought in where we need a, a bigger bundle of, you know, we need more financing, so I'll come and leverage some of the industry dollars that are, that, that are there and fund the graduate, postgraduate uh, uh, interns who are going to work within a larger FIAC project. So we've actually um, streamlined our processes quite nicely. It's an example of getting together and making it work for the user communities. Um, we were each initially doing our own external reviews. They have an expert panel. We have our external scientific reviews. That doesn't make any sense. Um, so we found a way to streamline the processes, for example. We found a way to streamline the application. So the application, the review, the funds going out. Um, so we work quite intricately together. And um, FIAC was the first consortia of its type in aerospace. Um, but there's a number of other ones that have sprung up. So there's one in bioprocessing. Uh, there's one in nanotechnologies, uh, there's one that, you know, so in composite materials. So there's a number of, of, of other ones that have replicated the PX model. So industry driven versus academic. Correct. And we get together and each fund the areas of next, because we each have uh, a part that we are stronger in to try to get together and, and together we fund the whole thing. Thank you. So it's 4 o'clock. So unless there's more questions, we'll have to wrap it up. Anybody else for one more question? All right, well, on behalf of everybody, thank you very much.